Hello, everybody. I am Brother Luke. Welcome to this Wednesday night Bible study for the Church of the Eternally Secure, CES. Uh, get your Bibles out. We are in Philippians chapter 1, and we'll start with uh, verse 25. But first, let's say uh, hello to the congregation. Welcome to all. Sister Renee, why don't you say hi to everybody first? I would be happy hello. to say hi to everybody. Hey there, guys. Uh, real quick, I didn't want to forget. Uh, thank you, Kevin, for asking people if they needed prayer tonight to post that. I do want to ask that uh, the congregation pray for Brother Jason Cripps and his wife. Uh, they are having some struggles and need their needs met. Um, and so I'm asking everybody to keep them in prayer. Uh, they're having a temporary setback and they need some help. So keep their needs in prayer. We know God always takes care of his children. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, Brother Ben, say hi to everybody. Hello, everyone. It's good to be here. Uh, looking forward to the study tonight. Uh, and I'm ready to get started. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I, I'm embarrassed. I, I Did you all hear the um, repeat? Because I forgot to mute that uh, thing. Ben, did you hear it? Oh, that was no big deal. You were on top of that quick. Yeah, yeah I, I, when I realized that, I thought, oh, no, I, I was able to stop it. But it's still, after all these years, I forget to do that. But I, I think it's uh, probably, uh, let me see, it's, it's either Ben or Renee's fault, I think, for we got in a conversation and they distracted I'll be your me. I'll be your speaker. Yeah, it can't be my fault. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, Let's look at the chat room first. I we started just five minutes behind schedule, but we still have time to say hi to everybody. So hello to all, uh, especially to our, our moderators, uh, Sister Heather, or Brother Kevin. And uh, I don't see Hendrix or Victoria in there yet, but thank you for being there. Uh, we, we've been doing great as far as um, not only the panel discussions we've been having, uh, not just Wednesday, but Sunday, Wednesday, and Friday. The, it's, it's been such a good uh, discussion and, and studies that we've had, but I also noticed that the, the chat room has been fantastic. Uh, I mean, they're, 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 what's that? Hendrix is here. Oh. You guys where? scroll up to the beginning. He's up there. Oh, okay. I, I, I scroll up to the beginning, but must must I'm not showing all of Oh, there he is. There's Hendrix. Okay, brother. Good that you're here. Uh, but uh, yeah, the uh, the moderators, uh, you're, you're so important. We, we couldn't function without you. So we, we really appreciate you uh, doing what you need to do there. All right. Uh, without further ado, let's go into the scriptures. Uh, well, I, I think my voice is recovered, but I kind of like... Uh, uh, you and Renee were doing some of the reading here. So why don't you uh, start with verse 25? Uh, which of you would like to read first? 25. I'll, I can, I'll start um, just because Renee's been doing it. And I would say read 25 and 26 together, it looks like. And then and then let give Renee the first sh shot at it, okay? Okay. Uh, Philippians chapter 1, verse 25 and 26 in the KGV reads, and having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for the furtherance and joy of faith, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. Yeah, so in order to understand that, we need to go up a couple of verses. Paul's saying, hey, I don't know what's better uh, for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I want not. For I'm in a strait betwixt the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. So this is what he's he's battling in his mind here. Hey, uh, I'd like to leave this body or, you know, die uh, and go be with the Lord. Um, but it's better for you that I stay here. And so he says, and having this confidence, 
I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith. And, it, and I was thinking that's really strong words from him that he, he really believes. And, and this, I think, is pretty apparent in Scripture. God doesn't just shock one of his people with their death. I think he prepares them spiritually and emotionally. Um, we see this several times in Scripture with Peter. Uh, with Paul, um, that they're told about their death before it happens. And I think that Paul knew this time that he was going to be spared, that uh, he would get out of prison and return to the congregation, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. So although they may have rejoiced that well, Paul's gone. He's with the Lord. They may rejoice more because he's staying with them a little while longer and they will see him again. And it's for their benefit. I, I think that's what he's referring to here. All right. Yeah. Thank you for giving us the context, starting a few verses. Actually, it was the, much of this chapter has been talking about this. Uh, Paul, and the fact that he's going to die and the the question I'm going to ask everybody uh, uh, to answer a question about that when I get my turn. But go ahead, Ben. Uh, let's get your thoughts on it. Well, I thought yeah, that was a great point that uh, uh, Brene made about how Paul um, is uh, confident that he is going to uh, uh, prevail uh, prevail through this trial. Uh, obviously, through Christ's uh, help. Um, and one thing I thought was interesting, too, that kind of stood out to me, at least, um, especially in verse 26, it says that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. So there is an idea in Scripture uh, where uh, fellowship or uh, intimacy does bring uh, a, abundant joy. Uh, and again, that joy is a, is a common theme uh, in this uh, epistle, especially in 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 the faith and knowing everything that God's even even all the adversity they're facing, uh, knowing that it God's doing it for His good purpose. Uh, but but that that the joy again it also is a, a major theme. And uh, here he's basically expressing you know by by coming to you again, uh, that your our joy essentially may be more abundant. Um, and so you know that's a common theme also too. I know like for example I know in First John. It talks about uh, so First John, for example, verse chapter one, verse three through four says that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and His Son Jesus Christ. And these things I write to you, we write to you rather, that your joy may be full. So the idea of fellowship um, and abiding in truth it brings joy. It's a, it's a fruit of the spirit, obviously. Um, and again, and by, you know, when I read fellowship, I don't mean, uh, it's it just, it's just greater intimacy. So, like James 4, 8 says, draw near to God, he will draw near to you. Um, so if, you know, uh, the more, if you want to experience joy, draw near to God, draw, abide in his word, abide with fellow believers, fellowship with fellow believers. Um, and I think that, that interpretation is even better, uh, even really kind of solidified by it's in second John. For, uh, chapter 1 verse 12 it says having many things to write to you I did not wish to do so with paper and ink but hope to come to you face to face oh, I'm sorry, come to you and speak face to face that our joy may be full so again face to face is the idea of intimacy you know when you're saying you know when you say for and that's a, it also too in first John not don't mean to get off track but in first John one of the common themes is fellowship I believe which is again just another word for intimacy or closer relationship um and, you know, it, it, there's verses of John that are kind of puzzling, like, that say, like, you know, he who hates his brother has not seen or uh, has not seen God or something to that effect. And it doesn't mean, like, he doesn't know God or he, he's not saved. It just means, like, he, he's not having a close intimacy with them. So, for example, if, I, if I'm if i a, a single person, I say I'm seeing someone, it means I'm having a special intimacy with somebody. So, um, again, just a, just a theme in Scripture, I've, and I'm seeing it here in Paul's epistle, where... Um, fellowship is, is, is extremely important. Um, 
And uh, fellowship with God is important not only through uh, sound doctrine. Uh, if we don't have sound doctrine, we, we, you know, we're going to fall into all kinds of error and we will lose our joy, just like the Galatians uh, did when they went into legalism. Um, and so it's important that we stay uh, closely attached and uh, you know hold fast to the to the true sound doctrine um, so that our joy may be full. Um, and again, that's it's a theme here in Philippians where uh, you know he he is he's really um, contending for the faith, uh, not letting it be snuffed out by uh, people who want to teach falsely or people who want to persecute um, others. So Paul knows even though among all this uh, adversity, uh, God's purpose will be done, and he's uh, he's rejoicing about it. Okay, thank you. That was excellent. I uh, really appreciate what you said about this um, uh, greater intimacy. I, I don't think I've ever uh, had it expressed that way, but that really, uh, for me, I, I think for probably a lot of people, if we keep that thought in mind, not only for First John, but but uh, right now, uh, I, I'm one that... Um, doesn't believe that uh, a believer uh, is ever out of fellowship with God regarding God disfellowshing a believer. Um, but I believe that we get out of fellowship with God when we get lose interest and in, 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 uh, uh, but God never turns his back on us and says, I'm, you're out of fellowship. And that's how I, I see it. But I can, I think the idea of greater intimacy uh, really, uh, that kind of makes it all make sense to me because even though we don't lose fellowship, what's the quality of the fellowship? Uh, God's, God's uh, you know, ready, willing to, to, to uh, have fellowship with us and be intimate with us. But uh, unless we reciprocate, unless we have that same desire, and uh, then uh, it's not a, a really intimate. It's not greater in, as great intimacy as it could be or, and should be. So I think that's a really good point you made, Ben. But let me uh, let me read these two verses, 25 and 26, in the Amplified and see if we can learn anything. It says, since I am convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that your rejoicing for me may overflow in Christ Jesus through my coming to you again. Well, I know we've said this uh, uh, so many times already. As we're only still in the first chapter of Philippians, but uh, I think we're going to see this throughout the whole book. It, it, I think the theme throughout it and the most important point that Paul is making here is don't let anybody or anything steal your joy. I don't know if it's happened to you, but uh, I've had many occasions where there's a problem or an individual or sometimes a group of individuals that they're just determined to try to make me lose my joy. And I, if, we, if we let them do that, uh, not only is it tragic that we don't have the joy, but it's uh, shameful that we allowed it to happen. So uh, really, that's the thought. I think we need to keep that thought in mind as we continue through this whole book of Philippians is that uh, don't let anybody or anything uh, take away your, your joy. I looked at it in the, uh, let me see, in the um, Young's Literal, and it, uh, it's stated in a way that I liked it. It says, and of this being persuaded, I have known that I shall remain and continue with you all to your advancement and joy of the faith, that your boasting may abound in Christ Jesus in me through my presence again to you. Uh, so um, being confident or, or persuaded of it, of this is what he's saying that uh, uh, I, let me ask everybody, you know, uh, you can answer it in the chat room, uh, but at least at least answer it in your mind. Uh, have you ever had this happen where people have actually got the victory or somebody's got the victory? They succeeded in, in taking away your joy. Has it happened to you? 
Renee or, or Ben? Oh, oh, yeah. Especially when I was young in uh, my faith, you know, when I really buckled down and got serious about it and was studying scriptures, when I'd hear people twist up the scriptures to try to tell me that God was mad at me or would forsake me or something. Yeah, my joy could be stolen. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. Uh, a lot of people try to poison the well with some kind of works. And a lot of people are content with that. You know, like they'll say, like they'll say, for example, say, yep, you're great, saved by grace through faith, but uh, just make sure you don't add or subtract from God's word. And, you know, and then, you know, then they wish you well, you know, as they leave. And it's like, no, that's a, that, that poisons it, weakens you. It's like, oh, well, maybe I have done that. And, um, you know, they, they always want to add like a little, a little caveat. Uh, you know, make sure you don't do this or make sure you haven't done that or, and uh, yep. all that stuff will poison you. And a lot of people, I think would just, they kind of say, oh yeah, I, I won't ever do that. So, or they, or they don't really believe and to be honest with you, they, you know, they don't believe in the first place. So it doesn't bother them at all. It says, yeah, okay, great. You know, but for me as a believer that really believe the gospel and to, it, it, it's a terrifying thing to, to know that the, the Bible is the word of God and that, you know, if you don't understand it, you could be condemned um, yep. that's a terrifying thought. And that's why, um, I'm very diligent to make sure I understand every jot and tittle as possible. Again, I feel like I do have a, a solid understanding. I'm totally convinced I have a, a solid understanding on, on soteriology, but there's a lot of people that come in and try to, try to, uh, add their little, um, you know, to add, drop their little impurities into the gospel or they try to stick you in the side with, with their thorns. Uh, they love about, bad news. Yeah. They love bad news. And, um, yeah, and, and and again, anyone I think who's solid in the gospel will will uh, you know that should bother them. It's okay to be bothered by those verses because uh, it, it's it's uh, an opportunity to dig deeper in and figure out to take the sting out of them. It, not to take the sting out of it in terms of um, if you're an unbeliever, because they they could be, absolutely be verses that will sting an unbeliever. But for a believer, if it's related to the law. There, you know, death has lost its sting. There, the the strength of the of the death is 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 the law, um, it, or strength of sin is the law essentially. So yeah, anyone who tries to bring d d bad news or even just weird, weird interpretations that are inconsistent with God's character, uh, even though they're not re necessarily related to soteriology, verses that they try to twist and and so, like like Renee said, make think make God think that make you think that God's mad at you. Or he's coming after you, or he's he he wants you to fail. He's waiting for you to fail. All those kinds of things. So yes, I agree. Luke and Renee, people will people will try to take your joy. And it sounds funny, but joy is you know it's it's, it's a fruit of the spirit, and they try to quench that spirit. And um, I think that's why we don't need to, always need to be on guard for that. Nothing can steal your joy in the Lord like a religious person. They will come in and just take all your joy and and that's the thing when a person gets saved you'll see them on, uh, on all our channels they are so full of joy so full of peace and then they'll go listen to somebody and come back in a panic just because they're babies and they sway to and fro with every wind of doctrine and the cure to this is growing in grace through the milk of the word having god show you having good brothers and sisters in christ that you can talk to about these things until you get full of the word and full of understanding, then no one can, can do that uh, to you. You know, understanding is the key and fear hath torment. It's not of God. If you are God's child, he is not out to get you. He's for you, not against you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so doesn't it say if God be for us, who could be against us? Amen. I don't know if I got that exactly right, but well, uh, I'm glad I asked the question. Uh, as I look through the, the chat room, uh, we got many people after I asked that question that said yes. Uh, so I would say that um, I, one thing, my mother taught me some interesting things, but uh, one thing she used to say over and over again is uh, misery loves company. But she was saying it about, hey, don't hang around with these people because it'll it's gonna you know that's what they want and they want to bring you down but I, i'm thinking of it a little differently now misery loves company that it is comforting for me to know that uh any difficulty or struggle that i have 
or have had that others have it too. And I'm, it's, it's not just me. It's, it's, it's a common problem. In other words, there's also a scripture about that too. Everything is, you know, all the problems are common to man. It's not unique. You're not the only one that has this kind of a problem. Anybody know that verse? <laughs> oh, so here, I didn't show you this yet, but uh, while I'm pulling my robe back, see what that says? I'm all in. All, all in. Now, in Las Vegas, you know, because of the casinos and the, and the, the gambling, uh, uh, there is there is an expression, all in. And uh, like, if you're playing poker and uh, some you're, you have a choice when you make your bet, and sometimes people say, I'm all in, which means everything I've got, I'm betting it right now. Uh, so you're betting everything on it. And uh, you're not holding anything back. You're not trying to save some for reserve. You're so confident that you're betting it all on this one thing. And of course, I believe that's uh, the uh, the key to the, the the understanding the gospel is that uh, we are going to rely 100% on Jesus. Uh, it's not about us. It's it's only about believing that Jesus will keep His promise that we're, we got eternal life. Jesus uh, is able to give it to us he's promised to give it to us and he's faithful to keep his promise so uh it's a hundred percent you can't be 50 50 like um i'm gonna believe in jesus but i'm gonna do my part too so i can go to god and tell him you know i deserve it just, i've done some things to contribute and, and i'm worthy but no if it, it's got to be a 100 jesus i remember a couple of years ago i was doing a series with and i had two brothers working with me and i say brothers because i don't question their salvation but i did discover uh, that they we reached a point in the study where it came out that they were they criticized me because and called me a hundred percenter oh you're luke you're one of those 100 percenters and that that just means that yeah i, I believe that a person has to be uh, um, believing a hundred percent in Jesus, they can't divide their faith between Jesus and water baptism, or Jesus and something else. It's like your hat, Renee. You want to show, show everybody your hat? Yeah, yeah. I had a viewer make these last year, and we gave out as many as we could get. Jesus plus nothing perfected forever. She had them made for my channel, and I sent them out. Mm -hmm. But that's a perfect example of the gospel and what all of us believe here, Jesus plus nothing. And we are perfected forever. Yeah. So that's the same as this shirt, Jesus plus nothing. In other words, all in, I'm, I'm, I'm betting everything. I'm betting my fate, my future on Jesus. Uh, and I'm, I'm depending on him. I'm relying on him completely. Uh, so I believe the reason I'm bringing that up is because I, I believe that is the answer to all of all the problems that, well, whatever it is that comes up that could possibly take away your joy. Uh, it, if we can set that aside and just focus on Jesus and know that he, this promise that we have from him and this, he loves us so much. It's the, the greatest love ever. And, and, and he loves you individually, personally, uh, and enough to die for you. If you're the only one, he would have died just for you. And, uh, and, because he did that, uh, he's able to give you eternal life, and he promises it to you. So uh, how could you ever lose your joy knowing what what is in store for you in the future? And it's guaranteed. Um, okay, uh, let's go to the next. Uh, let me see. We have 25 and 26. So this is 27 and 28. Uh, Renee, would you read 27 and 28? And then, and then let Ben first, though. Okay. All right. 27. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition but to you of salvation and that of God. So, um, so where Paul says, um, well, first of all, I would say, you know, that we, um, 
you stand fast in one spirit. I think, you know, I think a lot of division occurs uh, because people are operating out uh, out of a different spirit, not the Holy Spirit. They're operating in their own spirit. Yeah, and it's usually a spirit of pride. Um, and that's where, you know, that's where hypocrisy and leaven uh, seeps in. And it, it, again, we should not be lo out for our own. Uh, we should not be, you know, concerned for our own agenda. Uh, we should, you know, or even try to see, uh, you know, have a, we may have a vision for a church or how we see something should how something should go, but we also should leave room for the Holy Spirit to, uh, you know, correct us or, you know, forge uh, a path that we might not have foreseen. And again, a lot of people, I think a lot of uh, division occurs, occurs because people have different agendas. You know, they want to see a church conducted this way or a ministry, um, uh, you know, a ministry program that works this way. So, I, I, again, I think it's important that we all understand that we're really the whole idea is to get people saved and spread the gospel. And uh, we may have different means of doing that, but we all should have one goal, and that is uh, to get it out as, as, as broadly uh, as possible. Um, and with regard to uh, his statement of... Um, you, oh, it was just... We did we just read 27... Okay, yeah. So, okay, I, I don't think you read 28. Did you? Yeah. Okay, okay. So, um, anyways, with regards to uh, letting your faith be um, uh, be consistent with the gospel, um, you know, there's really nothing more, uh, there's probably not much else that's more uh, um, damaging to the gospel for, uh, for unbelievers than uh, people who who conduct their lives that is you know contrary to the gospel. So if someone's living in legalism or someone's li living in license, um, the world sees that as hypocrisy and it, it turns them off to the gospel. In fact, I wouldn't be. I think that's the, probably the number one uh, thing that drives people away. Is, is I when I always I always hear people say, "Oh well, Christian Christianity is full of hypocrites," you know. And yes, that's true. I mean, join the club. We're all hypocrites. That's the idea. Uh, uh, but again, we, we should not uh, accept, you know, I, I, you know, we, we all are going to all fall, fall short and stumble um, in many things, but we all, we, we should not accept or um, be content with our failings um, and, and, and embrace those things, embrace legalism or embrace uh, license. We should be intolerant of those things, even though we we ourselves might slip into those things periodically. We should always seek to, you know, escape it as quickly as possible, and that's why we all have each other to make sure we're not falling into those things, because those are all things that pertain to the flesh, and they have strong pulls. Uh, they have very strong pulls, even in subtle ways. So, anyways, um, I think it's yes, I think it's important uh, that we all um, uh, conduct ourselves worthy of the gospel. It means worthy, it basically means meet or cons act consistent with the gospel, which is grace. We should, we should, uh, treat the world, you know, with love and grace and not returning evil for evil. Uh, when, you know, it, you think about it, uh, you know, one of the greatest, it, grace is really a hack. One of the greatest reality hacks there is, because this whole world is based on give and take. It's in the laws of nature. It's in the laws of how man treats each other. And grace is totally antithetical to everything in this creation, this cursed creation. Um, and so, you know, if you want to hack reality or hack, you know, there, people call about, talk about lifestyle hacks. Uh, grace, uh, you know, not returning evil for evil, but returning good for evil. That is one of the greatest hacks. Uh, I mean, it's it's the ultimate hack. It's it's that uh, again. It it it. Um, I, I, I'm not, words escape me, but I think you guys get the idea is that, you know, uh, you know, if you're in a sticky situation and, or you're, you're in a, in a situation where it's just constant conflict, uh, try showing grace. And I, I you know, more than likely that whole situation is going to be diffused and you're not going to, it's no longer going to be a thorn in your side. Um, I mean, it's every facet of life. I try to apply that, look for opportunities to apply grace. Um, because it's, again, it's, 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 it's the, it's the heavenly way. It's not the earthly way. Um, and, and also to Ephesians 4, 1, Paul says, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. So again, we, we are, we already have a, a, a wonderful, eternal, righteous position in Christ, but our condition in time 
can can waver. And so Paul's always uh, admonishing all actually all of Paul, Paul's argumentation for godly living based on a, a, a reality. You know, so do this because you already are this. Um, and you'll see that all through Scripture. And then finally, uh, it says, "Do not in any way be terrified of your adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition, but uh, to you of salvation, and that from God." So basically, as the as the Philippian believers persevere in their faith, they should be bold um, in the presence of their enemies. You know, again, this is another hack. This courage in the face of adversity. I mean, that, that's counter to how the whole wor- world works. And so for the world to see such courage in the face of, you know, adversity and persecution, even extreme persecution, uh, will not only encourage them in their own deliverance, you know, it, it'll embolden each other. They should embolden each other when they see each other being courageous, but it will also uh, be assigned essentially to their opponents that uh, what what they're teaching, what they're preaching is is true. And if it's true, then they need to get on the right side because their you know their perdition is is certain just as their salvation is certain uh and they're courageous in it to the unbelieving world it should be um a signal to them that uh again just more conviction to them that they need to get right with god be reconciled to to god through the gospel okay thanks all right renee what do you say Yeah, um, I agree with everything Ben says, but I also want to look at 28 a little differently and see what you guys think about it. I'm not sure, but uh, Hendricks was mentioning conversation. Okay, it says, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. And I, I think in the biblical terms, conversation here is your attitude and what you say, um, amongst yourselves. It should always uh, elevate and be uh, along the lines of the gospel, uh, regardless of what's going on with Paul. Like he's saying, don't always speak to the furtherance of the gospel and have the attitude that God is promoting the gospel. It's all for the benefit of the gospel, regardless of whether I am free and I come see you again or if I remain in prison, that that should not determine it. No matter what, your conversation should be as becometh the gospel of Christ, whether I come and see you or else I'll be absent. I may hear of your affairs and that you stand fast in one spirit, one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. So no matter what happens, you as a group should be strong uh, and together in one mind and be in unity on that. But when it says, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. I kind of look at that as like he's telling you, don't be scared of things on the outside, like Ben was saying, of persecution and so forth, which to them, other people on the outside of the church, may see the persecution of you as evidence of your destruction. But to you, It's evidence of your salvation and that it's also of God because God uses the persecutions to strengthen and give courage to the church. So actually under persecution, the gospel and the church grows under this. Uh, So when I see in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which to them is an evident token of perdition, I agree it could be meaning that uh, to them uh it could be you know that god is gonna they are gonna suffer destruction but to me i see it as although don't be don't be scared of your adversaries because whatever persecution on the outside that you're endure enduring the world may see it as proof of your destruction but to you you know that god's allowing the persecution it says and that of god and your salvation so it's to further and see god uses all good things uses all things for the good of those who love him so i think he's just telling them don't be scared other people might see these things as uh that god's against you or you're sure to go to prison or die but to you you see god working in it and you just have to because god's on the throne 
Don't be afraid of what people can do to you. It's all in God's hands. And if it's occurring, if God's allowing it, he knows what's going to further the gospel. And so I think it's to so that they won't see these things and get discouraged. Uh, no matter what happens to Paul or to them, that it's in God's hands and that uh, it should strengthen them. They shouldn't lose their faith. I like that. Excellent. All right. Well, I keep forgetting to turn that mic back on. Um, well, I'm going to read 27 and 28 in the Amplified. Uh, it says, only be sure to lead your lives in a manner that will be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Let me pause there for a second. Uh, this is uh, being an ambassador. Uh, and we have to always uh, keep in mind, remind yourself if you have to, you are an ambassador. You're representing Christ and Christianity. And so that should be uh, more than any other motivation to uh, live a godly life. That to me is the, is the greatest motivation. I don't want to bring shame onto Jesus or uh, the church by uh, conducting myself in a way that is an embarrassment to the church. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm much more concerned in, about... Um, uh, people's doctrine, uh, they, you know, as I've said, you, you can be wrong about 98% of the things in the Bible, uh, and, and, and we're all wrong about some things. So thankfully, thank you, Jesus. I don't have to be right about all of it, but if you know who Jesus is and you know how to get saved, then that's really what really matters. So, uh, if someone's wrong on some doctrine, I, I mean, you know, it doesn't bother me, but if they're, if they're being in a, a bad representative and bringing shame and embarrassment on the church, that does bother me. And that's something that I cannot put up with. I, I have to, uh, I've had numerous people where I, I've had to uh, distance myself from them uh, because, because of their, their behavior is just embarrassing for the church. Um, and so let me go on. It says, um, so that whether I do come and see you or remain absent, I will hear about you, that you are standing firm in one faith and one purpose, with one mind striving side by side as if in combat for the faith of the gospel. And as if in combat, yeah, it, it, is, it is combat in a way. Uh, it is a spiritual warfare. Uh, we're um, fighting for the truth of the, of the gospel. Um, I'll read 28. It says, And in no way be alarmed or intimidated in anything by your opponents. For such constancy and fearlessness on your part is a clear sign, and that is a proof and a seal for them of their impending destruction but a clear sign for you of deliverance and salvation. Hmm. And that too from God. Yeah, so that uh, puts a little different uh, spin on it than I had originally thought there. So the idea of the, uh, where is it, how does it say it in the KJV? Uh, uh, in nothing, uh, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition but to you of salvation. Uh, I was in, uh, looking at uh, that as um, the world, um, uh, particularly the, in, in, Judea, in uh, that time in uh, Israel, and it still, it still holds true today for the, the Jewish people, and that is that uh, if you're uh, wealthy, successful, you're, and your life is really uh, wonderful, then they, that's an indication to them that you're in good standing with God. You must be a righteous person. Uh, we know that's not true, uh, uh, but uh, um, that's why that's how they would judge us. Uh, so um, the persecution, uh, it doesn't mean that God's against us. Uh, 
uh, it means that uh, we are preaching the truth because Jesus said, if you're going to go out and preach the gospel, well, they're going to mistreat you. We expect persecution, expect tribulation, because look what they do to me, and they're going to do work even worse to you. Um, so that uh, that should not be a reason uh, to, to uh, for someone to refute Christianity. In other words, those Christians look at look at how much they're suffering. Uh, that proves that God's not with them. Uh, that's that's uh, not the case. It's, it's the opposite of it. We're, we're being persecuted, and particularly in the first century, they were being persecuted and, and tortured, uh, put in the Colosseum, and eaten alive by, by uh, wild beasts. Uh, they went through all that, not because they were not blessed and, and uh, out of uh, good standing with God, but because they were uh, telling the truth, and that was the that was what we get for, for telling the truth. Uh, pagans, I wonder, yeah, pagans didn't get it either. Like their gods were with them if they had a great harvest and they were wealthy and they had health, then that was proof that gods, their gods, were with them. So they would think our god weak if he they didn't see worldly mm -hmm. things. Uh, being black, like if you weren't uh, healthy and rich and, you know, had the perfect family, then uh, your God was weak. And they would, nations would fight each other over whose gods were greater based on the worldly things they had. So this was uh, uh, difficult because the carnal mind is at enmity with God. It can't see these things. And that's why when the uh, emperors and uh, enemies of the early church kept trying to snuff it out, that it was beyond them why it kept growing the the harder they pressed on the christians the worse the torments and persecutions the greater the church grew it made no sense to the world mm -hmm. yeah it didn't make sense to the jews either because like peter would say after after the rich young ruler he says you know it's harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven than the camel to to go through an eye of the needle they said well who then could be saved they were like they right. marveled right they marveled. exactly and that's why it was so uh, amazing to hear the story of Lazarus and the rich man. The rich man was in right. uh, the fires of the lake of fire, you know, <laughs> a rich Jew. That was like beyond anything that they could comprehend. Hmm. Well, um, lately, uh, it seemed like I'm losing my memory here. So, um, I always write down my thoughts as we talk, because if I don't, make some notes here i forget things but i did forget something so i want to go back a half dozen verses or so uh, to we were talking about when paul uh said uh to live a, with uh to live as christ but to die as gain to be with christ is far better absent from the body is present with the lord uh that portion of scripture is uh, i'm wondering uh, I, this is a question for everybody in the chat room in the congregation now again, and that is, have you ever, uh, because of those verses and the, the, that promise, uh, reached a point in your life where you yearned to actually be gone and be with the Lord? Uh, maybe it's health issues. Maybe it's some horrible things that are happening in your life. And just, you just, it's just life is, the quality of life is so bad. You just don't want to live anymore, but you know that something far greater is waiting for you. Uh, as, as Have other people had that? I know I have because I've had a lot of uh, difficulties with health uh, the last uh, 10 years. And uh, there were times where I thought, I don't want to be here anymore. I'm just, it's just suffering too much and there's no end to it. It's just one thing after another. And I just yearned to be gone and be uh, out of this body and out of pain and be, to be with the Lord, which is far better. So I'd like everybody in the chat room to answer that question too. Have you ever had that feeling, that, that those same thoughts that I just expressed? Renee and Ben, what do you say? Uh, yes, and often. And I, I go through this. Uh, the only thing that like, gets me going sometimes, like especially with when my disability was so excruciating. I, I don't know if you guys remember, but I, I couldn't sit or lay. So I would literally have to stand up and, and then fall from exhaustion. 
I, I couldn't lay in a hospital bed. You remember the nerve pain was so severe. And I was like, I, I don't know how long I, I can do this. I just don't want to be here anymore. And uh, I just remembered that he, he, he strengthens us and that there's a purpose and, and that God's going to take me when my purpose is done and that I, I needed to abide in that. And, I, and always going back to what others have suffered and endured made my situation seem doable. You know, seeing how God gave other people strength to get through what they got through helps helps me get through it helps me get past it but i've had those same kind of thoughts how about you ben have you had any suffering that brought you that you to that same point not uh, not to the extent that you guys probably have in, in terms of health and pain i can't imagine that i can to uh, i can totally understand thinking that uh, i there are times in this life where i'm just like i, I see the world and i get fed up and i i i, I grown the same things uh i i've I grown similar sentiments but at the same time i always say okay well i have so much to learn yet you know and and like i i don't know and for me i just see there's so much more i need to understand about scripture uh and that people have done a poor job of explaining or the church at large has done a poor job of explaining i just i just see the the huge opportunity ahead to make such an impact um, again, I, not me alone. I'm not saying I'm anything great. I'm just saying that there's a lot in scripture that, um, I just think a lot of understanding is not yet been fully understood and it, it there's just a, a huge opportunity. Um, and so that, that motivates me. Um, that really motivates me. That's where, that's the, my primary motivation in life really is just, just to understand God's word, um, and, and to grow in it daily. So, uh, that's the, that's the big, that's the struggle I have, you know, so how do I, how do I maintain the energy? How do I maintain the focus, uh, on that? Uh, but yes, I agree that there are a lot of times you just look at the world and say, wow, it's just, it's hopeless. It's just, people won't listen. They won't wake up. They, you know, they don't want to hear that even if the people who are claimed to themselves to be Christians, they like, and, I, and again, I'm not talking about anyone here. I'm just thinking, like my parents, for example, my, my brothers and sisters, they claim to be Christian, uh, but they're Catholic and they won't uh, listen to any sound doctrine. They won't receive any correction from me about the 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 false beliefs of Catholicism and things like that. So uh, I, th that's just endlessly frustrating. Um, and to see them to raise their kids that way, um, it, it, it's really, um, yeah, I, I, I totally see what you guys are saying. And I, I, I see the same things. But at the same time, I see that the huge opportunity to serve the Lord. Uh, there's a lot to be done yet. And... Um, I just pray to God that he'll use me to, to fulfill as well. So. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm happy to hear you haven't reached that point yet, Ben. And the reason I phrase it that way is that uh, if you live long enough, you will reach that point because eventually we do start to fall apart. Uh, the, the, the body's like a machine and the parts wear out and, and eventually it's, it, it is inevitable um and it it's very painful when it starts all breaking down and so you will reach that point if you live long enough but but uh i hope i hope you certainly have perfect health and no no pain and i don't want that for you but i think that uh it's good to be aware of that and, and know that hey uh, that that's what, just what happened it's just like when you're when you were first told i don't know if you can remember uh maybe you were three years old Maybe you were five or 10 years old and you were first taught that people don't live forever. You know, you, they, all of us are going to die someday. Even you, my child, are, will die. Uh, I don't know how many people can remember when they learned that, but we all have to learn it at some point. And it's the same thing with not only are we going to die, but uh, unless you are spared suffering, uh, you know, suffering comes along with getting older and, and dying. There can be very, very, a lot of suffering involved in it. So I'm glad you haven't had to go through that, Ben. Uh, let's read a, a bit. Let me see. Uh, ben, you, would you read 29 and 30 for Renee? To, to... Sure. Okay. For unto you it is given in, in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake having the same conflict which ye saw in me and now here to be in me. Yeah, this is why I was saying let's, I wanted your input, you guys, on what 
you thought about my interpretation of 28 when it said, and then nothing terrified by your adversaries, you know, stuff on the outside, the persecution enemies you have outside, which is to them an evident token of perdition. Like I didn't see it as their token, a proof of their destruction. I saw it as evidence of our own destruction to the lost. Like the lost would look at the adversaries and the things coming against us as an evident token of our destruction. But to us, our fearlessness in the situation is an evident token of our salvation and that of God, the strength that God gives us in the face. And, and this next verse is part of the reason I believe that. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. So this is an opportunity, Paul is saying, for you to suffer, there is reward in suffering. Jesus told Paul, uh, go, you know, I think go to the street straight and I'll tell you all the things that you'll need to suffer for my namesake. So it's an honor to suffer for the Lord. It is rewarded having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. So uh, I think he is, the conflict he's talking about is whether he, would rather stay here and be with them or to leave and go be with the Lord. And so they will face the same inner conflict. Uh, so I think that he's just saying that, that they're going to probably come to the same place he's in. Uh, it's not only they're, they're, you know, it's not only for them to be a part of the body of Christ, but to suffer and to share in the sufferings of Christ. Um, and that they too will probably come to the same conflict of mine. I don't know if it's better to, to stay here or to go, you know? So, um, I, I really think all of that works together. I was looking at some of what Hendricks was saying and, and OUDC were saying, and it's true that when it says, let your conversation, uh, become at the gospel of Christ. Uh, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. So uh, I think he's they're both saying that having this attitude equips us to face the things that we're going to face, that they were uh, facing in their persecutions there. Um, so I think that's it. Yeah, I, I think it's kind of um, like the questions I've been asking here. Now, Paul asked that same question that, that uh, at the very end, uh, that what I've gone through, you can expect to go through it too. Uh, ben? Well, I, I, I would say, yes, they can expect it if they want to, uh, because I think, you know, Kelphus love this passage because they say, oh, see, uh, it's been granted to you to believe on God. It, 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 they use this verse as, as a, one of their uh, pet verses to s teach that God gives uh, saving faith. He He grants it. Like you have yeah. no control over you have no control over it. God just grants it on you. Well, and and they yeah. Also, yeah. So they they'll say that that God this the verse they use to say that God grants uh, faith to the elect, and then they'll say that that faith is irresistible. Uh, so no, one, they can't resist it. But but if that is true, then Paul is teaching here that not only is is God's grace irresistible, but but the the idea of suffering for His sake is irresistible if they're both granted by God, which I think is silly. Um, and I don't think that's what this verse is teaching at all. In fact, the word "believe" there is not in the act; it's not in the passive voice, uh, meaning that it's not like something that it happened to them. It's in the active voice, meaning it was something that they, it, it was sourced in them. It, it, it's something they actively chose to do. It's an indicating an act of the will. So again, a passive voice would be, the ball hit me. Uh, an active voice would be, I hit the ball. So it, it, it again, it says, the, the idea for believe there, it's in the active voice, indicating it's an act of the will. Um, and, and like Renee said, I think she said it perfectly, the granting is not, you know, uh, the 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 uh, the the, um, the the faith to believe in him and the suffering that, that that they will face. It's an opportunity. It's not it's not the actual uh, 
um, substance. It's it's an opportunity. So Paul's saying, hey, and I don't think this is even teaching that every to, to every this is true for every believer. He refer specifically saying this to this church because he says having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here is in me. So again, they they saw Paul suffering, and I think he's saying to them, uh, God God granted you an opportunity to believe in him. And just as he granted an opportunity for you to believe in him through hearing the gospel and choosing to believe it, that you can also now choose to suffer his for his sake. It's a, it's an opportunity for rewards. Um, and I think, it, you know, it's a, it's a really, we could, should consider that a huge privilege. Um, and, and, you know, a, a great opportunity and a huge privilege to suffer for, for God, for Christ's sake. Um, but it's not it's not uh, a requirement for salvation by any stretch of the imagination. It says in Hebrews, for example, that the uh, you know people were uh, not willing to receive deliverance because they they knew that they if they had if they don't if they didn't take that deliverance that God uh, made an opportunity for them uh, that they would they would have a better resurrection again a more abundant kingdom entrance as uh, Peter refers to it as so. Um, Again, I think this it's important this verse is not teaching at all that God grants saving faith and he grants suffering. It's an opportunity. Um, you know, so um, it, it's an opportunity. It's a, it's a head, it, God's laying in front of us and we should we should take it. Uh, you know, you don't have to, but it, it, it's an opportunity to serve the God who saved you and to uh, an opportunity to, to earn rewards. So, um Again, I, and I don't think it necessarily it's all for all for all people, all Christians for all times. It's just he's saying it to this particular church. Uh, but, but that's not to say that it doesn't happen to uh, happen today, and still uh, God doesn't still offer the opportunity for us to suffer for Him. Um, and there's different forms of suffering too. I mean, there's suffering from you know, physical persecution, but I think there's also suffering in the sense of uh, spiritual persecution, where again. I think uh, all of us can relate to where people are constantly saying we teach falsely that we we are the devil and we uh, teach doctrines of demons and uh, our teachings are from the pit of hell. I mean, all all that's physical or I'm sorry, spiritual persecution. Um, but also too, what we talked about before, uh, what what uh, what Luke was saying about people trying to steal our joy. That's a form of persecution as well. And it, it, to be honest with you. I, I much rather take physical perse persecution over spiritual per spiritual persecution. Uh, I've had my fair share of it, and I find that much more uh, taxing than any physical uh, persecution. Okay. Um, well, when you started off, one of the phrases that you used uh, surprised me. I'd like to ask you for a clarification, and uh, uh, not only so I understand, uh, but I'd like to know uh, if there's something in the verses now that that uh, make you say that. But you used the term, you said, uh, not only is God's grace irres irresistible, but, and then you went on. <clears throat> now, maybe I, I'm just very highly sensitive to, you know, the, uh, the, the, tenets of Calvinism and the, the terminology that they use. Well, he was speaking on their behalf, saying yes, they to say that. Yes, I was saying that that's what they, they teach God's grace is irresistible. And I was saying, who, well, who, that's who's they? Who's Calvinists, they? Calvinists. Oh, but I, how does that relate to the verses that we're talking about? Well, I, 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 was, saying, I was saying they the Calvinists love this verse because they teach that. Uh, oh, you said you referred to Calvinists? Yes. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I missed, I missed that part. I'm sorry. Yeah, he's discussing it, saying this verse is twisted by them to um, say he was given for you to believe. Right. Yeah, like so, a good. massive thing for them. Good. I, I, I didn't, I must have missed that first part. Uh, I didn't know you were uh, refuting Calvinism, but I, I, I thought you were using it, one of their uh, oh, key no. tenets. So, okay, thank you for the clarification. Um, let me read uh, those two verses in the Amplified. Uh, it says, um, For you have been granted the privilege for Christ's sake, not only to believe and confidently trust in him, but also to suffer for his sake. And so um, it's, it's a privilege, 
uh, but uh, did you know that suffering is a privilege too? Did you ever think of suffering being a privilege? Uh, oh, I don't like to suffer. Um, and uh, I'd like to think that if I suffer for Christ's sake, and I, I have had to suffer for Christ's sake and in the last uh, 32 years uh, because it's no secret what I believe. Now, if you're a closet Christian and you keep your faith, you know, private and secret and you don't talk about it, then you're, you're spared that. But if, if you are uh, someone who is uh, bold and uh, you know that there's going to be consequences as soon as you dare, like, all you got to do is um, test this out sometime. If you're, if you're in a group of people, and um, if you start talking about God, but it's generic, you just say God and that's it. But uh, uh, they could pe people can interpret that as oh, that's the universe. You know, a lot of people now think of the oh, the universe is, is did that for you. But um, but when you get uh, specific and say Jesus, as soon as you use the name Jesus, guess what? All hell will break loose. Because the name of Jesus causes division, and uh, uh, it's going to get dramatic. But that's why some people know that, and they they uh, don't want the conflict. They they're afraid of it, and they keep it their faith private and secret. Uh, but here it's telling us that it's actually a privilege to be able to suffer. Now I haven't had to suffer physically. I haven't been tortured physically, and. You know, and I'm imprisoned. Uh, I, I'm still alive, so I haven't been killed and martyred for Christ. But I, I have suffered to a certain extent for my faith. I don't need to go into all the, the details. But um, so it is a privilege. Why? Why would that be a privilege? Well, I, I think that that relates to the, the reward system that we, you know, Paul and Jesus talked about. Jesus said, don't build up your treasures on earth. Moth and rust will destroy it, uh, and, but build up your treasures in heaven where moth and rust can't destroy it. You'll have eternal treasures, treasures that will last you forever. Uh, and so we are encouraged by Jesus and Paul to get busy working and, in this case, even suffering because there, there are five crowns, and uh, one is a martyr's crown. And martyrdom is, um, you, did you know that some people would not consider the Apostle John a martyr because he wasn't killed for Christ. But he was imprisoned. He, he certainly suffered for Christ's sake. And that is also martyrdom too. It's just any suffering for Christ also would be a, under the broad definition of being a martyr. Um, so it's a privilege. Keep that in, in mind because uh, you're going to uh, be rewarded. Now, not, not now. It's going to hurt now. <laughs> you're you're going to you probably wish you weren't suffering now, but in eternity, you'll be uh, thankful that uh, you had the privilege to suffer for Christ's sake. Not only to believe and confidently trust in him, but also to suffer for his sake. And so you are experiencing the same kind of conflict which you saw me endure and which you hear to be mine. So all the things that Paul has said about his own feelings, he's saying this congregation here that uh, that they they understand because they're they're going th either going through or will go through the same kinds of things. Uh, all right. So we'll, now, sh should we stop because the, it's an end of a chapter? Certainly, that's the time to stop. Or do chapter divisions really mean anything? Well, I mean, we still got 20 minutes. I, that was a joke. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I can't believe you took me seriously. You took me seriously. Oh, okay. <laughs> what? I fell for it. You did. Yeah. Uh, of course, we're going to continue, but um, th this just gives us an opportunity to say that, uh, okay, the end of the chapter. But, but does that necessarily mean that it's the end of the the theme, uh, or we'll, we'll find out, I guess, right? Okay, let's go to uh, 2, verse 1. And Renee, would you read uh, 1 and 2 for Ben? Yep. 
if there be, and here's the key, therefore, <laughs> therefore, it's continuing thought. So obviously, you know, just because it's a new chapter doesn't mean it's a uh, not a continuation of the thought prior. If there be, therefore, any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. It's a classic Paul speech. Okay, so I had to look up that word bowels again. I know you meant it, you, you admonished me before, Luke, that said that it meant uh, affection. And by the way, um, tell me if I sound any different. Um, I, I took off my headphones, big bulky headphones. And I think, because I, I think a lot of times I think I come off as like I'm shouting because I have these big headphones on. And so I took them off and maybe I'll sound, maybe I'll sound a little bit uh, more rational. You sound good. Okay, sound cool. good. okay. So the word bowels, uh, that is the word. Okay. Yep. The New King James translates it as an affection. Um, and we you went, we read uh, verse one and two. Is that how, as far as you went? Yes. Okay. Both one and two together. Well, this is kind of what I mentioned before, uh, Paul kind of touched on it earlier, where, you know, we, we all have, we have, you know, we're all baptized into one, we only, we're all baptized under one baptism, uh, one Christ, one spirit, and so we should all be of, of the same mind, and that like, like-mindedness like should be for the furtherance of the gospel, and really not uh, have anything to do with, with self-serving, well, with self-serving at all, and in fact, there's a, a verse that coming up here again, and we're, we read earlier, and I think chapter one, there was, was a verse that used the word "the bowels of Christ," which meant the, which you know, which would be understood as the affection of Christ. Um, but the bowels, you know, is the belly. And there's a verse in, in, in the next chapter called it, it, talking about false teachers who do, aren't aren't of the same mind or same one accord, who are self-serving, whose God, their belly, their bowels, is uh, their um, their God is their belly. So they're they're feeding themselves, where you know they're serving themselves. Where we should uh, be the exact opposite of that. We should be um, selfless, and that's one of them. Again, that's a, a major thread throughout this all this epistle is being uh, selfless, because that's what grace teaches us. Grace teaches us to be selfless and to be self-sacrificing. To you know not only have our lives be uh, a living sacrifice for the for our Lord, but for uh, His children. So. Um, in that respect, you know, if you if you are not being self if you're not being selfish, then um, you're already on the right track to, to serving God and uh, helping to spread the gospel. Um, that's how I take those verses. Okay, thank you. Well, I think you uh, this word bowels is going is very memorable to you now, isn't it? You gutted me. <laughs> gutted you. I had one guy make a video against me about eight or ten years ago, and and then it was it was such a horrible video that they made that someone in the a comment said, "Oh, you gutted him like a fish." They were so happy that what they did to, did to me in in rebuking me. Okay, oh, sister. My gosh, you've had a video made against you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's part of the persecution I was talking about, Renee. <laughs> All right, so let me turn the camera on here. All right, so I like how Paul puts it here. <clears throat> it's just the way he talks is so bizarre sometimes, these rhetorical questions. Of course there's consolation in Christ, but that's exactly what he's saying it for, if there be any consolation in Christ. So what he's really saying is the consolation we have in Christ should motivate you to do the following. It's just his way of saying, seek the depths of the consolation in Christ. And because of that, so it says, if there be any consolation in Christ, that's, that's a, I don't want to say rhetorical, but more like the motivation should equal the consolation. If there be any, therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, of course, there's comfort of love. If any fellowship of the spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. 
So it, it's just another way of him saying, seek the depths of these things we have in Christ so that you can work together. Like it, it's kind of like saying, think on the, the, the comfort that we have in Christ, the love that he shows us. And that way it can promote being of one accord of one mind and loving one another if there be any consolation in christ so um it's just a weird way that he says that but i like the way he says it you know i mean you've heard people say if you have any love for me at all it's like of course i have love for you it's just it's another way of motivating them uh to be unified Okay, very good. Um, all right. Um, here, so here's a footnote that's uh, it's not in the NABRE. This is an amplified footnote. They don't have very many footnotes, but on verse 2, it says, The key to understanding this and other statements about love is to know that this love, that is the Greek word agape, is not so much a matter of emotion as it is of doing things for the benefit of another person. That is, having an unselfish concern for another and a willingness to seek the best for another. All right, well, I hadn't really thought of agape that way before. Um, all right, I want to read uh, these two verses in the Amplified. It says, therefore, uh, so again, that tells us that... Uh, He's still uh, connecting the dots now. It's a chapter division. By the way, uh, for those of you who have not uh, heard this before, I've, I've said this numerous times, but um, you know we have new people coming in all the time. And uh, the the Bible, when, in, in its original writing, uh, it did not have two things that we have today, and that is the the scriptures were not divided into chapters. And the chapters were not divided into verse numbers. Uh, the chapter divisions happened first about a thousand years ago, and the uh, numbering of the verses happened about 500 years ago. Um, so some people want to use the chapter divisions and the numbering, and uh, I've even heard some people say that, that that part of the Bible is also inspired. Uh, I. I wouldn't go that far, but there's, there does seem to be some interesting things that we can find in uh, what they call Bible numerology, where numbers uh, can have um, seem to be significant. Uh, so I'm not going to discount it and, and rule it out entirely. But this here we have a chapter uh, beginning. Uh, last chapter is over. We're in a new chapter, but we're not changing subjects. He says, therefore, so he's saying, I'm continuing my thought, and here's the conclusion based on what I said earlier. If there be any encouragement and comfort in Christ, as certainly is in abundance, right, Renee? That's what you said. I don't know how you phrased that it. Was but... funny. I said... uh, <laughs> as yeah. if. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, it's not that uh, there's, a, there's any doubt or any question about it, because it says if. Um, here they're interpreting that as, as there certainly is. Of course there is. Um, if there is any consolation of love, um, if there is any fellowship that we share in the spirit, if there is any great depth of affection and compassion, that's the bowels part there, uh, depth, as Renee said, uh, affection, as Ben said, uh, so it's it's a, a great depth of affection and, and compassion that we're talking about. It's 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 a, it's a deep deep uh, of uh, feeling. It's not something that's superficial. Um, and so it, it's saying if, but but these are things that that, that are not in doubt. That these are things that are certain. And uh, now verse two says, "Make my joy complete by being." of the same mind, having the same love toward one another, knit together in spirit, 
intent on one purpose and living a life that reflects your faith. That's that's the uh, being an ambassador again and spreads the gospel. I mean, see, that's another thing. Uh, living a life that reflects your faith and spreading the gospel, these two things really need to go together. Because if you think you can spread the gospel, but but your life doesn't reflect it, uh, all you're really doing is, is uh, making people uh, say, I never want to be a Christian. They're nothing but hypocrites. Look at that guy. You know, he's telling us about uh, 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 Jesus, but look what look what he's doing. You know, he's he's a hateful person. He's uh, he's uh, he's mean spirited. You know, I've seen I'm saying that because I've seen a lot of street preachers that uh, their demeanor is just so ugly that 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 repels people from Christ instead of drawing them to Christ. It says uh, spreads the gospel, uh, which is the good news regarding salvation through faith in Christ. So, uh, yeah, I think, I think they did a good job on those two verses. Uh, let me see if there's a footnote in the NABRE. Uh, no, not really. All right, so let's go to verses. Um, uh, th th verse 3, there's a period there, so I assume that can stand alone. Uh, Rene, who, who read it last? Was it, was it Ben read it for Rene or Rene re read it for Ben? Uh, it's my turn to read. I'll read it. Do you want me to read three and four? Read, read, for, read verse three and let Rene uh, tell us about it. Okay. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. That's a good one. Yeah. Uh, and again, we take this back to the motivation. The motivation should be if there's any consolation in Christ. Let's go back to the consolation we have in Christ. Out of Christ's uh, self-sacrificial love for us, out of his abundance of mercy uh, and fellowship of the spirit and joy, uh, we shouldn't do anything with the motivation through creating uh, fights amongst one another for lifting ourselves up for vainglory just for the purposes of standing out. Um, you're looking good. Everything that we do is in service of the Lord and always putting others' needs before our own, which I myself am guilty of of not doing often. Okay. That's what we're supposed to. Hmm. You're making a confession now, Ray? Yes, I'm just trying to be obedient to the Catholic doctrine of confession. <laughs> <laughs> All right, confess your faults one to another. So you're that's appropriate. That's actually true. That's actually true. Yeah. Okay. All right, brother Ben. Well, yeah. Again, I think this is Paul starting into his kind of rebuke again of of these false teachers, which he alluded to earlier, and I think he's going to kind of bring to a crescendo in in chapter three. But in verse in, in chapter one. Um, I'm sorry, chap yeah, chapter 1, verses 15 and 16 talked about those who were trying to take advantage of Paul's imprisonment to, uh, even though even though p potentially they had the right gospel, they had a wrong motivation. Um, and uh, again, they, they I think, you know, they knew that they saw that Paul was getting uh, monetary support from the church and other support, but they're probably mostly interested in the monetary support. And so they figured, okay, well, Paul's in prison, so we will take advantage of his absence and, um, you know, put our place, put ourselves in the place to receive that, that monetary support. So again, they did it for selfish gain. Um, and, you know, whether or not they believe the gospel or not, doesn't, it, it's kind of immaterial to, to Paul's argument is that that's not how we should be. We should not be like, uh, you know, very, you know, carnally, we should not be like the world. That's how the world works. They it's always look it out for self, self, self. Um, and, you know, it's, a, you know, it's a dog eat dog world, the, the, the survival of the fittest, you know. Um, so we should not be that way. Um, we should, we should be the exact opposite of that. Um, and, you know, God's way is the exact opposite of the ways of the world. Imagine that. And, you know, again, we shouldn't be, uh, driven by selfish ambition and, um, we should always be looking out for, for others and looking for opportunities to serve. And I, I believe God chose us those opportunities. You know, it's not like we, you know, I don't think we have to look very hard for opportunities to serve. I think there's a lot of opportunities. It's not mon just monetary. I think the far more better uh, opportunities are to serve are through spiritual 
spiritual, um, you know, riches. Um, so like good teaching or, um, you know, just providing uh, the means for people to hear the gospel, um, all those kinds of things. Okay. Well, I really love how it's written in the KJV. Uh, I'll read it again. It says, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. Vain glory. That's a very interesting word. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Shouldn't there be others? Uh, let a uh, mind, let each esteem other. Is that a misprint or is it, does, does it say that in, uh, in everybody else's? Does it say other or others? Yeah, it does it say, says, uh, it say other. Yeah. But in other. loneliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Yeah, I think it's just the way he says yeah, it. Yeah, I think it's just the King James yeah. language. Yeah, a singular person, other person, other than yourself, I'm assuming. Yeah. Other in general, it could be just. Uh, rather than uh, choosing the plural, a singular also covers all others. Other could just be anyone outside yourself. Yeah, that is a good point. It is correct either way. Um, all right, so I, I love how it's uh, the, the language of the KJV, but I'm going to read it, the Amplified, to see how it amplifies it. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. Uh, through factional motives or strife, but with an attitude of humility, being neither arrogant nor self-righteous, regard others as more important than yourselves. Well, I mean, each one of these points is a, is a beautiful uh, principle. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, let me see, vainglory, uh, what's the definition of that? So, so first, or empty conceit is, is how they are interpreting it in the Amplified. How would What would you say the word vainglory means, Renee or Ben? I, I just put it as a self-centered to lift yourself up for any anything that would lift yourself up into a position above others. Mm -hmm. for, for, to, be, to be seen of others, to be noticed of others for your own personal glory. Yeah. Yeah, so vain or vanity, I think we all know what that means. And then glory, so it's trying to keep glory for yourself, I guess, huh? Yeah. But uh, it says, but in lowliness of mind. So I would call that lowliness of mind is humility. And humility, I think, is the fundamental virtue that we... we uh, if we don't have humility, I find it really difficult to think that someone could even come to Christ and, and uh, believe because uh, if they're not humble, how, how will they even admit and recognize their need for a savior? Um, so uh, lowliness of mind, that's uh, humility. Let each esteem others better than themselves. Think more of other people. Um, uh, Someone bought me a, a T-shirt many years ago when I was street preaching. Um, Justine. Every once in a while, Justine pops into our chat room here. She lives in Las Vegas. I haven't seen her for quite a long time. But but um, she bought me a shirt, and it said, uh, J-O-Y, Jesus, others, yourself. And the, 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 the concept is that um, if you desire real joy, then then this is the order. Uh, this is the priority, prioritize in this way. And that is Jesus first, and then others after Jesus, and then yourself last. Uh, There's a song, a song, a children's Sunday school song called J-O-Y, 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 this must surely be. Jesus first, yourself last, and others in between. Oh, wow. Cool. I didn't know that. Okay. Uh, so uh, it's an old idea, but that's, uh, that's the interesting thing is uh, even I have come up with something uh, like I, uh, let's say a, 
a, a turn of phrase uh, and, or a, little, uh, a neat idea. And I thinking, wow, I, I didn't read it in the book. I've never heard anybody preach it. So I'm thinking maybe this is an original idea from Luke. Uh, and, and then eventually I see on a church wall, it was written on a church wall. There's one that came to my mind and it is uh, uh, people, people don't uh, care how much you know until they know how much you care. Um, but that's what I've hap has happened to me uh, many times in my life. I think I got an original idea and I think Ecclesiastes says there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, but uh, can we, can you do that? Does anybody here do that? Say, just tell me in the chat room or Renee and Ben, have you been successful? at uh, J-O-Y, uh, Jesus first, yourself no. and others in between. I, I'm guilty. And what's strange is that I know that is the key to joy, but it's contrary to my flesh. You know, uh, that is the key to joy, to keep Christ at the forefront of my mind, always keeping him the priority, putting others' needs above my own. If I'm always outside of myself, that's what I'm always telling people that, you know, if you be a good friend to people. Be there for others. Get out of yourself. No matter what you're suffering, find someone that needs assistance and you'll find that your own things become healed as well. And so I know that that is a key to true inner peace, but I fail at it constantly. It's the opposite my my carnal nature. You know, I, I know that feeding my needs first is never the way to have any fulfillment, but it seems to be the nature that's the first instinct. So you have to kind of, oh, I can't hear you. You're muted. Okay. Uh, well, maybe I better remain muted. I don't know if I should say this, but oh. Renee, are, are you feeling really better now that no, you're kind of releasing it? You're confessing your faults twice in <laughs> Confess. Is it is it making you feel good to get this out? I'm just getting it out. Yep, laying it all on me, guys. I don't. I don't hear Ben confessing though. I don't know. What's going <laughs> ben hasn't confessed any faults tonight, and uh, maybe he'll tell us about the J O Y if he's been able to apply that. Ben. Well, uh, I would say. Uh, well, I, I see you want to you want to rope me in into your misery. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> No, um, I'm teasing. Yeah, I'm, def I'm definitely guilty by association. Um, uh, I would say, and I try to be, I, I, don't, I don't really think about it too much because I just try to do the right thing. Now that I, I definitely don't always do that. And, and, it, and for like the little things, I'm definitely guilty. Like, for example, if there's like a, there's some kind of, some kind of dessert that my wife made, and there's only one piece left, I will take it, <laughs> you know. Uh, but on the bigger things, uh, you know, the big things in life where, where I invest my money or invest my time, uh, I think I'm pretty good at it. Um, but again, it, it, it that takes you know that takes planning and forethought. But the things that are don't take any planning or forethought, like immediate need, like something to satisfy my flesh immediately, like like I said, like a piece of cheesecake or something, I'm pretty bad at that. Um, and um, but there, you know that, that's why I'm always I, I I actually do try to, as Paul says, beat my body so that I can. Um, bring it to conformance of my will. Um, and I, I, I do my best, but I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I can only do my best. I'm, it's, it's a, this, this body is a, is a, it's a body of death. <laughs> and, um, so yeah, I mean, I, I definitely, uh, when it comes to the big things, I try to do the, you know, I tried, I tried to li live off the Christian life, but, um, that is on a day to day, on a moment by moment basis, I fail miserably. Do you forgive me, Father? What's that? <laughs> no, I think I'm teasing. <laughs> okay, say three Hail Marys. Okay, that was a joke, by the way, everybody. Uh, okay, well, I, I will say, you know, every once in a while I have to talk about my wife, and oftentimes it's, it's, it's a joke, you know. I mean, it's, it's not really a joke. She really did take the hinges off of a door so that she could come into a room where I had locked myself in. She took the hinges off the door so she could come in and continue lecturing me. So, I mean, there are some true stories I've said about my wife, 
but um, uh, I'll say that um, she's probably the most thoughtful person I, I know, and, and she really does uh, others put others before her, herself. Uh, so I, I, I've seen it uh, done. I just don't think I've been able to do it myself so much. Um, well, let's pray we all get better at that. Uh, okay, I guess this is time to stop. Uh, let me see what. How far did we get? Verse three, Ben. Yeah, so we'll we'll, we'll pick up with verse four next time. Um, all right, let's uh, let's take some time now to kind of uh, make our closing remarks here. Uh, uh, ben, will you go first? Well, um, well, we're still we're still early on in this epistle, I guess, but it's not a very long epistle. Um, it's got kind of, it's kind of a short epistle, like I mentioned before. I think it's essentially a thank you letter to this church for supporting him when no other church w would, and to teach them that uh, they should continue in that, in that, um, you know, c continue in in, um, in fighting for the gospel and furthering the gospel, and in that sense, they are partakers with him. Um, not only in their fellowship of, of spreading the gospel, but they also have an opportunity uh, to fellowship with him in terms of, and in, with Christ in, in with respect to suffering. Um, and so that's an opportunity they have. And um, and so again, I think we, we all should arm ourselves with that that same kind of mindset that you know we never know what's going to happen and and we should uh, we should always take advantage of, of the time that we do have. Um, you know. Uh, What's the saying in the Bible? Um, redeem the time. Um, so that's what I'm always seeking to do, and I think that's what we're doing by by these studies. And um, and uh, I'm looking forward to the next one. All right, thank you, brother. Um, all right, Sister Renee, I, I want to hear your uh, your closing remarks, but I'm really uh, eager to hear your thoughts of, about uh, tomorrow night's program. I'm I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, we're having tomorrow night at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on my channel, Renee Roland channel. I'm having a guest speaker, Chris Date from the Rethinking Hell website. Uh, and he believes, as I do, as a conditional immortality believer, um, we believe that the lost suffer the second death. They perish. It is a biblical belief. Um, and so the reason I'm having him on is not to convince people to come against eternal conscious torment, but to stop calling those of us who do not believe man is immortal without Christ, because the Bible says we're not, they're risen again to condemnation, to destruction. Uh, we believe that the lost perish in the lake of fire, and there he's going to explain where uh, why it is a very biblical doctrine, how the eternal conscious torment came to be so popularly believed because pagan Gentiles came into the early church and brought their beliefs with them, not understanding verses and idioms from the Old Testament. And they turn these things like eternal fire and the worm dieth not. Uh, to mean something that they were never supposed to mean. They were representative of death and corpses and destruction. And instead, they they use these things to support their already uh, pre-existing belief in the immortality of the soul of man, which is actually not scriptural. So um, he studied this for many years. He explains the verses in context there's only three or four people can use to support eternal conscious torment and then there's i think there's over 40. i came to this conclusion a couple years ago when i gathered all the verses i could find on the fate of the dead what happened to those that were lost and i had just tons and tons and tons tens of them like 40 or 50 verses that the wicked were going to be destroyed, consumed, perished, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Way over here and just two or three verses I couldn't really understand until I found parallels in the Old Testament to understand them. And so what, I, what I'd like is to have uh, my viewers hear this gentleman out. I do not agree with him on all his doctrine. 
He is only here to discuss the uh, doctrine of conditional immortality, that only those in Christ live immortally. And so God offers us life eternal or death, the second death, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. And so we can accept one another regardless of which position you take without calling each other names. It does not have to cause division if you believe the lost perish or the lost live forever in torment. It does not have to cause division. And so I'm hoping people will see that this is a biblical doctrine based not on philosophy, not on what we want the scriptures to say, but what we really believe the scriptures say. And so we're going to take a look at that tomorrow night. And I'm hoping everybody comes with a gentle heart, an open mind, and treats this gentleman with respect, uh, knowing I do not agree with him on everything. But this particular doctrine, I happen to think he is very well informed on, and I've asked him to come talk to the viewers. So I hope that you'll come with an open mind and kindness and be willing to hear your brothers and sisters out on this. And it, no matter what side you were on, that we're kind to one another. And, and this is not something we need to divide over or call people heretics over. Both are perfectly legitimate uh, stances, I believe. So he'll be on my channel uh, tomorrow night. If you want to look at his, his website, you can go to RethinkingHell.com. Um, but, uh, if you have questions tomorrow, I don't know how many he'll get to, but I may have time at the end to ask, uh, questions at the end. So you may want to be in chat for that. Okay, guys, I hope to see you there. Okay. Awesome. Just remember, be there or beware. <laughs> okay. Um, the uh, study tonight was uh, very enjoyable. Uh, I just think this whole book so far, uh, Philippians, is a joy. Uh, that's really what it's about, and it is a joy to study it. And I would say if you don't have joy, uh, well, maybe you better check, double check to see if you even understand what the gospel is, and and uh, uh, because the gospel is eternal security and the blessed assurance. The assurance from Jesus that you're going to go to heaven, it's settled. If you, and so you need to understand and believe that, and that should give you this blessed assurance. Uh, blessed means you're happy. You should be happy because you're assured heaven. Um, so this is a great book to go to, to, uh, you know, get yourself uh, uh, the, the joy uh in, in, in all things, no matter what, what happens in your life, can you can you keep your joy? And I've, uh, I've, I've had times where I haven't been able to do it, but um, the, the worst thing is to let someone else steal your joy away. Uh, I certainly will, will not allow anybody to do that to me. Okay, um, so this is Wednesday. Uh, make sure you join Renee. Uh, I'll be there uh, uh, listening, and uh, that's 9.30 Eastern Time on Renee Rowland's channel. And then for CES, uh, this is Wednesday, so uh, the following day on Friday, join us on this channel for the Fun Fellowship Friday night. All right, thank you, everybody, for participating tonight. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.